Introducing the D'Addario Auto Lock, made with locking strap ends for an easy to use clip on system. When you're done, just pull the latch and slide it off. Keep your guitar on lock with the Dario Auto Lock. That's LG from Thelma and the Sleeves. How are you doing, LG? I'm doing okay, man. How are you? I'm doing real good. Hanging in there. I'm in Nashville, Tennessee right now. Where are you at? Uh, I don't like to say where I live. I good. Like to keep it private. <laughs> I, like, I, I, I totally appreciate that and respect that. So moving on. Actually, I shouldn't move on. I need to uh, alert people that you have a fucking awesome podcast called Queen of Shit Mountain. Thank you. And uh, Yeah, we need yeah. all the help. Yeah. yeah. Well, you, you know, you, you typically have a wide range of guests. Uh, how do you select your guests? They're definitely always in the musical range, but they're not always artists themselves in, in, in the, the natural sense of like a band member or a bandmate or a singer or something. Well, all my actually, all my guests, I think so far. Well, no, actually, I did do one with the lady who owns a venue. But for the most part, they've all been um, friends or people I admire who I like. I feel like they're fundamental um, values to be a queen of a shit mountain. Um, <laughs> and I like, you know, like it's kind of like dogs in the yard. Like, you know, when I meet an artist that I feel like because it is so rare, um, kind of has those qualities and has those values. I get, you know, we start sniffing each other's butts and it's basically just like a podcast of us sniffing each other's butts in the yard, you know? <laughs> well, for Gearheads, uh, one guest that you had on was Julie from Earthquaker. That was a that was a fun episode. Oh, yeah, that was, an, I guess, yes, that's another one who wasn't an artist. But Julie is just like, I think she's just been one of the most, you know, and I mean, I'm sure some of your audience will either appreciate this or not, but, you know, the the industry has always been mostly geared towards men. I mean, you don't. You don't, you really only have to pick up a guitar world from like, you know, probably like four years ago to just see like the only women in there really being in bikinis and shit, you know? Yeah. Julie's been really a great champion of not only endorsing female artists that she really, and not just female, but just diverse artists and trans artists that she really champions and, and gets behind and... Also, um, yeah, just like, you know, just being outspoken about why that's a problem and encouraging other companies and holding them to that standard. And I think that between that and She Shreds, just as a guitar player who's been around for like 10 years, that's, those are the two kind of most uh, noteworthy things I've seen in the last 10 years that have really push that progression forward and it's been really nice and and i know that you've done videos obviously in their gear but you uh, correct me if i'm wrong but you worked there for a time right at up and yeah Africa? wow you're such a good interviewer i'm not used to actually having an interview who asks me good questions um yeah i did i worked there for like four years four years ago uh my band well the lineup of my band that really toured a lot kind of fell out um and right after we had toured with Eagles of Death Metal and dropped this new record. And <laughs> it was like, uh, some people who've been with us long enough to know were like, man, you guys really almost busted through that glass ceiling and then just like nothing. <laughs> 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 um, and it always makes me laugh, but um, I can laugh now. Um, but um, yeah, no. Yeah, it was like, it was like really intense, so I was like pretty down. I was like, I just need like a Joe job, you know, like something I can just go in because I just worked so hard on Thomas Lee's for so long. I just like, I just need a Joe job where I can go in, clock in, you know, hang with the the, the bros at work, you know, <laughs> just sit back on some Mountain Dews and make some pedals, which is just like, you know, the most intricate shit. And I've I've always loved soldering, so it was a really good opportunity to get better at more intricate soldering and like, and also like to have, do you have to hand those pedals in and they like really quality control there. So like it had to be perfect. So yeah, it was really cool. I built pedals there for about a month and, and I, and I didn't also have a van at the time. So I used all the money from doing that to purchase a new van to tour in. And, 
yeah, Julie is in Earthquake Advices. Uh, not only do they make fantastic pedals, but <laughs> um, they, she's just a really a great person, and their company is amazing. And everyone who works there is a, like someone who would come to your fucking show. Like that's people are always like, oh, the pedals are expensive. It's like, yeah, we would have a lot nicer shit in this country, not only for your possessions, but like people and quality of life. If like y'all just paid a little bit more for shit like that, you know, and. And they also have a lifetime guarantee. So, like, if you buy a fucking pedal from anywhere else that's not a boutique place or somewhere, small company like that, you're not going to get that. So, it's, um, yeah, it's kind of, it's, like, foolish. It's foolish to not buy pedals from Earthquaker, I think. Yeah, Julie and Jamie are good people. And, And transitioning back to the guitar that you're holding, because I think most people that have seen you around town, whether it was at Candyland, I've seen you open for Ron Gallo, Thunder Pussy, it's always with Fancy. So tell me about Fancy's story. You know, I mean, scale model guitars, I mean, he's legendary in Nashville. And he's, you know, that's, that's what makes it, you know, a crazy difference for me and for a lot of artists who kind of forge their own trail and, and don't really fall into stereotypes and shit like that. Like, you really need those people to help you up. And, and I never had a nice guitar before Fancy. And luckily Dave would, like, fix my guitars every time I would smash them, you know? (laughs) I would like, like, honestly, I feel like he just built this so he would stop having to work on my shitty guitars. But yeah, I would bring him like these $200 guitars that I like jettisoned across the stage and like, Dave, you know, I snapped the neck off or Dave, the pickup's not working. (laughs) And he would hook me up and and fix it. And then he's like, finally he turned to me one day and you know, we're both from Illinois. So like, uh, he like turned to me, so we have that kind of kindred, you know, Midwestern shit going. And he was like, he's like, uh, you want a nice guitar, LG? And I was like, well, I don't, I don't, it's like, you know, it's like pretty woman. It's like, what would I, what would I do with it, you know? And, um, uh, I went to visit my aunt and my uncle had this like, um, you know, really great, uh, SG from the 60s it was like when they were still called Les Paul specials or whatever and mm-hmm. it was like a natural finish and like it was just like uh it was just amazing I was it had the Bigsby and I was just like I have some one like that's the fucking one I want so I sent him a picture of it and I was like this that's the one I want and um and yeah I just uh you know I I, I wanted fancy across the fretboard because um that's my favorite song about being white trash because you know yeah, you never, like, you know, growing up reading guitar magazines and, like, you know, fumbling around trying to play shit that, went, you know, and learn. And I just would have never thought someone would have invested the time and energy into making a guitar for me. And he, this one, and the thing with Dave is, like, you really have to be very specific about what you want. And you really have to, like, be a part of the process with him because he, he will make you exactly what you want if you, you know, do that. And... You know, I wanted a natural finish so it didn't look too clean and, and like, new for too long. Mm-hmm. So all he put on this was gun oil. And so it's literally probably gained two pounds solely just off my sweat and blood and spit and hot wax and beer that I've poured on it. I mean, I've only had it for six years and then look at it, you know. It's disgusting. Yeah, it's it's worn and torn. Yeah, and the ebony fretboard, it just feels like a Cadillac. It just feels so nice, and I love the frets. They're they're like like tall and skinnies, I guess, which is not really something you want in Nashville, <laughs> but they're really great, and um, yeah, it just feels very luxurious. And I think he, I guess I've had it for six years, and I've toured probably at least a hundred shows a year with it and the the neck he hasn't adjusted the neck once oh wow and that's and through the mountain what about uh the pickup is that something you requested is that something special there uh he he put this burst bucker one in here um he put this burst bucker one in here and he was like if you don't like it just let me know we'll swap it out and i've always i've always loved it um and this was actually Ben from Fly Golden Eagles this was his Bigsby and he didn't like the Bigsby because he's like Oh, it doesn't stay in tune. I was like, who the fuck cares? <laughs> I, was like, <laughs> I was like, I don't use a Bigsby like for its like intended use. I do a lot of like, you know, 
like I do a lot of like grand like strum out like and then I'll also just like lift my guitar with it and do that so it's like if I'm playing a Bigsby like it's party time like I'm not worried about staying in tune um but also I mean this guitar is so well built I I actually haven't been playing fancy a lot because you know I've been playing this telly that he built me um more at home but fancy's kind of like a she's a hot rod you don't really take her out for Sunday drives you know so yeah but yeah I love her it, it's just and it's the most important thing for me was that it be very very light because mm -hmm. my neck like I was playing a I was playing a Fender Jag Master it was like the 30th anniversary silver sparkle one and it was actually fucking dope but it was so fucking heavy and I one time I got out of the uh van after a weekend of shows and i just like because i thrash so hard on stage like i literally like had to like slide out and like have someone like push me up <laughs> <laughs> and i was just like let me see i'm 20 i'm 26 now and if i keep it up like this <laughs> I, was like, <laughs> I was like there's there's absolutely no way so i was like please make it as light as possible and i i think it's got to weigh like six or seven pounds like it's something ridiculous it's so light Every time someone picks it's, it up, they're just like, wow. But yeah, it's it's literally perfect, and it's it's a part of my skin. So I hope that answers have, have your you, question. Have you ever had to use it for its unintended uses or purposes on stage? Because you guys have some wild shows. Are you asking that because you've done some research, or are you asking that because you just think that might be something that I'd do? <laughs> I think it's a 50-50. <laughs> um, yeah, I'd be actually like... Oh, geez. And this is why I told, he's like, and that's why I said to him when he built it, I said, if you build me a nice guitar, like, it's got to be pretty indestructible because I do crazy shit with my guitars. <laughs> and, and he was like, yeah, you, you got, I'm going to make you something like a Louisville slugger. Like, you're never going to break this shit. And I was like, okay. And sure enough, like, maybe two weeks after I got it and I'm like holding it while we drive, I'm like, like telling bitches get away from the guitar like you know like, and um fucking this guy we were in uh lexington and he came and i was playing topless because i can play topless and you can you know observe that and be a participant in that experience as long as you don't fucking touch me uh because like if there's gonna be a bunch of dudes moshing around topless like i have every right to do that too without you know being a sexual object um and so this guy comes up behind me and he like grabs me by my tits and I was just like the fuck and I just like grab him by the shirt and I like threw him down on the ground and I just start bludgeoning him with it and I hit him here and I hit him in his ribs and then luckily for him because not for me because I was totally bitten his ass but like these like motorcycle dudes like took him outside and threw him outside but yeah, so there's some really good pictures of me circulating on the interwebs of me beating him with this. And honestly, I was so scared when I got, uh, and that's when people were like, oh, did you really hit him? I was like, I popped a, I popped a string. <laughs> <laughs> I hit this motherfucker so hard. Um, but yeah, uh, yeah, it actually sounded, I was so worried, but it actually sounded better after I beat him with it can't argue I that i i literally have no idea but like it i feel like it was like it sounded like i don't know like warmer <laughs> <laughs> well what do you typically use for strings and tunings um well for tunings i just do standard okay you know uh and then for my actual strings i just use ernie balls but actually i just got um i just got my hands on these uh rock and roll classic uh super slinkies um and uh I, I had a package somewhere but i think i used it um but yeah those things are amazing i really love the way they sound so i'll probably start putting those on all my guitars um because they're just like they just sound so fucking good what uh gauge like a 10s or 11s i think yeah i think they're 10s i always get 10s I think. Gotcha. I want to show the package though, because like you don't really see it, like it's like easy to miss, but it, they're really good. I really like the way they sound. Um, and I've been like, actually, that's one thing I've been doing in quarantine is like thinking about things like that more. You know, yeah. <laughs> like, 
like really like oh here's a now's a good opportunity to like try out all kinds of different strings and see how, what I really like, you know? So. Well, right on, Nana. Can we talk about the skate deck uh, Telecaster behind you? Yeah, yeah. Let me grab her. Actually, it's a boy. I don't know why I called, why I misgendered this guitar. <laughs> 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 um, this is my, uh, this is my skateboard guitar. Also, Dave made me this. Um, and again, it's, it doesn't have a finish. Um, really? I mean, maybe a... No, I don't think it has anything. Um, which is great because it looks way too nice and I hate it, how nice it looks, so... What kind of instructions did you give Dave on this one? Well, you know, actually I went to NAMM in LA and Anaheim, um, with Earthquaker, Earthquaker to do like a She Shreds presentation video thing. <laughs> and I played one of the fucking, I played one of those Prisma guitars you seen those? Yeah. And I was like, fuck. First of all, this makes me feel so happy because they're repurposing skateboards, which would just normally get thrown away. Mm -hmm. And also, like, I love the, like, you don't know what colors are going to be. They're really cool. So I asked Dave, I was like, have you seen these? And he was like, yeah. I was like, because I called them and I was like, would you give me an artist deal? And they were like, oh, sure. It'll only be like <laughs> six grand. And I was like, no. No way, dude. I can't pay six grand for anything. Um, yeah. My van, my van I tore the country in with four other adult women didn't cost six grand. Um, but uh, maybe someday. Um, <laughs> but so I, I got a bunch of skateboards. I brought them to Dave and I wanted a Telecaster because I've always loved Telecasters. And I don't... No, I honestly, I'm not, I'm not talking shit on Dave because it's, it's a beautiful guitar and it's mm -hmm. really, it's my favorite to play now. I'm sorry, Fancy. I, say, I hate when I say that in front of Fancy <laughs> because he put these really, well, anyways, let me finish that thought. This doesn't look like a Prisma guitar. He, at all. <laughs> I don't think. No. He did it different. He took the, so you have the holes right here. Those are from the skate deck, which is pretty cool. Mm-hmm. Um, and then he took the colored parts of the, and put it together. So it looked like kind of like an American flag, which is also cool. I mean, it's not, not cool, you know, <laughs> it's cool. Um, but it doesn't look like a Prisma guitar, but it's still very cool. And I think part of that was like how much money I had to put towards it. And also like time for him because he is so busy. Mm -hmm. Um, so I think he went with this instead, but I also like, think it looks great. And he actually made the pick guard out of the skate decks too. So, but yeah, I, I absolutely love it. I love the big, you know, uh, knots right here in the wood. And I think it's gonna, I, as, as it does look very gaudy right now, which kind of, cause I think I want to switch to Chrome hardware because the white is just a little much for me. Um, but I think it's going to age just like fancy. I think it's going to age like really well. So the more, that's why I've been playing it a lot and taking it out on the road. Even though it is not like fancy, it's, fuck, it's got a way like, it's got, it's got a way like, I don't know, like between 11 and 12 pounds maybe. It's so wow. heavy. It's definitely like unchambered Les Paul heavy. But the best thing about this guitar, aside from having, my grandpa built guitars. Um, when I was growing up, he was a luthier and he was also sold guitars um, and took me to guitar shows and his initials are TRK and he would put those on top of the guitars he would build. So I had his initials oh. put on the fretboard um, in honor of him because he's the reason I play guitar and also because he is a country and bluegrass guy. So I figured he would really like to have his initials on a telly mm -hmm. by a super good craftsman like Dave, of course. And... Um, yeah, so it has the best thing about this guitar is it has these Yardbird signature pickups, um, and these things fucking rip. <laughs> like, <laughs> I'm will I'm willing to put my neck through hell in order to have these pickups on stage because they sound especially with our music, especially because when I got fancy, we were pretty like one speed, one like fucking loudness, like one sludge fest essentially but like now 
as I've progressed and matured and, you know, the lineups have changed and, and, and gone on, it's more dynamic. So having a guitar with some more range and some more ability has been really nice. And yeah, I, I also just, I love, the thing I love about tellies is they stay on you straight. You know what I mean? Mm. They stay on yeah. you straight. You know what I mean? They don't have to go like this, it doesn't go like this. And if you keep it straight, honestly, it, it, it pretty much doesn't really fuck with your neck that much. So I don't know. I just love it. I, uh, and like I said, it's not a Prisma guitar. And I'm not talking down on Dave because it's still uh, a really great guitar. Um, and Fancy, I think, is 57. And this one is 91 in the scale model guitars. Um, so I just feel honored to have two guitars that he built because he's such a great person and, he's, and there would be a lot of a lot of rock and band roll bands in the last 10 years that live in Nashville and don't get make any money and can't afford nice guitars and getting their guitars fixed like a lot of the good sounding guitars that they have you can most always like connect that to Dave because he's taking care of so many people and, and fix so many uh, fucking rascal fucking shithead musicians <laughs> shit for like... There's a reason like, why he's you know, so busy. I feel like, yeah, I feel like we should make a statue of him out of like, you know, like a rock and roll statue of him <laughs> put it up outside of Dino's because he's fucking hooked so many fucking musicians up, you know? And he, he really does. He'll be like, oh, Dave, thank you for fixing these three guitars, you know? I'm not going to say that he still does that, but back in the day he did. He's got a wife and kid and house now, so I don't think he does it as... Um, as much, but um, he's definitely helped a lot of people out. Do you mind plugging this one in so we can hear it? I love this guitar. <laughs> oh, okay. It's got, it's got to be refreshing, to, or not refreshing, but it's got to be like invigorating to have a guitar that when you pick up and play, it gives you that rush. I mean, both Fancy and Teddy both give me that rush. But right now, um, Teddy, I mean, Fancy is also just like aesthetically, like, because I definitely have sort of grown out of just only needing one pickup, but like, honestly, like, Fancy just like aesthetically, which means probably I probably just need to switch this pickup. I'm probably just bored with this specific pickup. I maybe need to try something a little different, maybe. I don't know. We'll see. But um, but yeah, but no, Teddy, it sounds so good. Is there any is there any other guitars that you want to talk to us or show us before we move on to amps and pedals? Um Yeah, actually. I uh, for those of you who are on a budget, for those of you who are on a budge, I would recommend this Yamaha Pacifica. Oh. Um, this thing is fucking awesome, and I love that it, um, aesthetically, hold on one second. I love that aesthetically it kind of looks like Fancy and Teddy because it, it has a natural finish, so mm -hmm. there's no... There's no finish on it really, maybe a little on the body, but the neck is dry as bone, and um, and uh, the tortoise shell pickguard, and I really, yeah, I just love this guitar. They gave it to me, obviously, but um, I love it. He gave me a Rev Star too, and the Rev Star, I'd, I'm just not a fan of like Les Paul kind of guitars, so I would, it didn't really do anything for me. It's a great playing guitar, but it's just not something I would take out, but I actually take this out and play it because, um, you know, not everybody can have a Teddy or a Fancy. So <laughs> I like to have something else to show that like, it's not the very expensive guitar that makes me rip, you know? I rip because I have, a car I, I just rip, and those happen to be my guitars. You this rip, one rips too. You rip regardless. But what do you? Yeah, what have you regardless. enjoyed about having a P90? Because it looks like there's a P90 in the neck. Oh man, this thing sounds so fucking good that people will be like, "This P90 sounds so fucking good," and this humbucker too. People will be like, 
oh, that's not stock. That's not how that guitar came. And I'm like, 100%. Like, I'm, I got a free guitar, but now who the fuck am I? Like, I'm not fucking, you know, Jennifer Batten. Like, no one's going to send me, like, my specs, <laughs> you know? <laughs> like, um, not Yamaha. They're very generous, though. And, yeah, it's not, it's not a... It's not souped up in any way, like it just sounds good. Like that's the first thing I do when I get a guitar at like a guitar store or anything. Like I go and I know it's annoying, but like to me that's like how I tell. I'll be able to like a guitar. <laughs> what are you What are you looking for in those instances where you're doing that? What are you looking or hearing um, them to hear? Ease. I want it to feel easy. I want it to feel easy to bend, and I want it to also have a lot of sustain. I want it to like. I want to be able to like hit a note and then like walk out and go get a cup of coffee and then you know read the newspaper and then come back so you know I mean obviously every anyone who's ever listened to my band or seen me live or play like it's obvious I like to ring notes out for long periods of time and just go like this you know? <laughs> so. but yeah no I mean I just do a lot of bend <laughs> And that's what Dave said, actually, one time when he was working on my car, I was like, LG, a half-step bends. I was like, all day long. <laughs> I was say, do you want to grab Teddy or Fancy? And, and I want to know about your PV here, and then we'll start talking pedals. Yes, the PV. Now, I remember one of your episodes, I think it might have been one of the first ones, your, uh, where it was just yourself, you said a comment against used Fender amps. I think it was in relation to doing South by Southwest. So I was curious what amps you use, and then eventually I listened long enough and you, you gave praise to PV. So obviously you're a PV girl. So why do you dig those class I'm amps? I'm a PV princess. I'm a PP. I'm a PV princess. <laughs> <laughs> what do you dig about the classics? You know, people always say LG, because you can't see it because it's, I'm in a very large room, but I have, I have like, 30 amps and probably, probably have, I don't know, six PVs just in this room alone. Wow. <laughs> so people are always saying to me, LG, why don't you try to get sponsored by a PV? And I said, well, if I had a fucking time machine, I would. Because <laughs> <laughs> nothing they've made. Um, and I was a big fan of their new little rumble bass uh, knockoffs. They actually were pretty cool, but don't I wouldn't recommend them now because I've had I had mine for like six months and then it sound now it sounds like there's a screw shaking around in there, so uh, that's not PV. That's not a fucking PV. <laughs> you know, like a PV should be able to be thrown off the Empire State Building and then fucking play a fucking arena. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, but yeah, this PV I've had I've had it for ten at least no twelve years. Um, and at first, when I first started playing shows, I had that one of those little Vox Pathfinder little damn little guys. And I was playing at Springwater with one of those. <laughs> I think it has like a little six inch speaker, or 10 inch. No, it's maybe a 10. And then my fucking guitar player I played in a band with back then, she got a Fender amp. She got like a hot rod or something that shitty like that. And I was like, Fuck, she's so much louder than me. And every time I'd start rocking out, like, my amp would fall forward. <laughs> <laughs> and so I was working at Bellasino's Pizzas and Grinders on Wipers Road. Um, and rest in peace. And um, I was working with this dude named uh, Ricky. And Ricky was like, hey, LG, you want to buy an amp? And I was like, what kind of amp is it? And he was like, it was an old PV amp. It was my uncle's. <laughs> and he's like, he's like, I don't know, like, and he had a Memphis Les Paul, too. He had a Memphis Les Paul, which I, sh I wish I still had, because I bought both of them from him for, like, $50. Wow. And back then, back then, minimum wage was, like, six bucks. So, like, that was actually a lot to spend on a man for me, because I was in college. And he's like, yeah, I don't know anything about it, but, you know, it's yours if you want it. So I bought it for 50 bucks, and then I, like... You know, chuck this thing in practice, and like she gets her fucking fender up, and I was just like, Ugh. 
So it wasn't even a matter of preference at all when I first got it. It was a matter of it being cheap. And then I was so much louder. Than <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, still not loud enough, you know. And I wanted to be louder, louder. Because, you know, back then I still had hearing. And then, <laughs> so I went to the guitar center. And I was like, what's the cheapest cabinet you got? And they were like, uh, this 410 Fender amp. And I was like, that'll be nice because... When I first got this amp, it was too muddy. So I thought maybe the Celestian speakers would, like, clean it up a little bit. And, um, yeah, I fucking, I plugged this fucker into this 410 or 412 cabinet. I took the two speakers out of the actual amp itself. And I've played it like that for 12 years. And, you know, I am at this point, I definitely could have bought another amp, but I just... I just love it. I love the warmth. I love how how much my playing affects how it sounds as a tube amp. Um, I love that beers have exploded in the back of it. And, you know, I mean, we shove everything in our a Honda Odyssey. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Like, we tour in a Honda Odyssey. So anything that we have has to be, like, super durable and reliable. And, yeah, it's just been a great amp, I think. The only time it was out was for, like, uh, a couple shows because I needed a new transistor. Um, and because it's half tube, half solid state, right, I think? And our tra- well, anyways, I needed a new transistor. Some guy put it in, and then I was good to go. And I've probably changed the tube, like, three times in it. <laughs> like, it's a- it just sounds fucking good. Um, the phaser actually sounds really good on it too. I don't, I don't use it a lot, but yeah, I've never turned it up at a show past four, ever. Okay. And I'm a big believer in like filling more space rather than being loud, right? So like, I used to tour with dual cabinets, and I had this Holmes vintage cabinet, Mississippi Blues cab. I still have it, and head. And I had this stack, and I'd put them on both sides of this stage. And when I would kick on my UE300 Ibanez effects pedal, it would only be going to that Holmes. So it was like Tube Screamer and Chorus. And then this on the other side, like holding down like the sludge and the mud, you know? Mm-hmm. And so it was just like, neither of them were turned up above three. But like, if you were a sound person, you had like all the tone. Like, any tone you wanted. And if there wasn't a sound person, like, it was like, like I said, you were filling up more air. You were filling the room up with more sound, but it wasn't necessarily like, oh, fuck, this is too loud. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. It was fucking, it was a good setup. But then once we had to get a smaller van, I had to just go down to having one cabinet, you know. But I do have a backup now of my classic X. Um, so I'm happy. I found one. And I just have it in case this one, for God forsake any reason, something should happen to it. Because um, I would probably burn someone's house down if something <laughs> happened to her. <laughs> I would, if, like, I go to a venue and they're like, power burned out my amp, I would burn this, I would burn it down, okay? Because <laughs> this amp is very important to me. Putting venues on notice. And now, with the record you put out last year, did you record at this, or I, I I think you I saw that you recorded with like a super speaking of small amps in the Vox Pathfinder. Didn't you record with like a gorilla? Yes. <laughs> I, what was that like? It's just like any you know. It's like uh, I was just like I and let me be let me be a hundred percent about this gorilla. Okay. Um, I did not use the gorilla on three songs every other song I used a gorilla but one of the last three songs that we recorded we did live and we did um they were heavies and when you have heavies uh I'm gonna use this I'm gonna use this baby um but the absolute rest of the record um is 100% done on the gorilla and it is a fucking great amp for recording I wouldn't even use it at home to play it's not like it's it's interesting. It's like the poor man's champ. Um, it just sounds really good. It cuts. Do not use the tube stack knob. Um, never touch the tube stack knob. That's garbage. But just the actual 
amp itself. Uh, it's the GG. It's the GG30, and the day before I announced that that's what I used on the album, I bought two more off of Goodwill, Shop Goodwill and Reverb because I knew that they were going to get more expensive because I was going to use it, and then a lot of other, you know, if you look at a lot of these jackasses' houses that y'all, these records of the last 20 years, you're in their studios, you're going to see gorillas and PVs. <laughs> Bet you 100 bucks. <laughs> okay. Yeah, and like a, another amp you see a lot too is uh, like uh, with like High and Fire and Sleep with uh, Matt Pike. He uses pig noses, which are kind of the same deal. Super small amps. Well, actually, gr pig nose uh, and Gorilla were the same company. Um, oh. Yeah, for a minute. If you read the history of the Gorilla. <laughs> <laughs> and actually, when I announced that, so I bought two of them, and then one of my fans, he had purchased the TC-65 Gorilla uh, at Fanny's, I think, in Nashville, and brought it to our record release. And it's a 10-inch speaker, so it's like a big Gorilla. And I was, I'm sorry, I was shocked by this amp. It, I would not say it would be like a good all-around amp, but if you were in a band with two guitars, and one of the amps was a PV, and the other one was for mostly leads, and you put that gorilla on there. This gorilla fucking cuts. And it sounds really good. My my one of my other guitar players used it on a New Year's Eve show, played a strat out of it, and you know, she's on stage next to my fucking cabinet with this little TC what is it? Yeah. Sixty five. And it's I'm sorry, just that's what my my main thing about my gear is never turn your nose up at anything. You know what I mean? Um, always check something out. That's what has been the biggest lesson to me because uh, I've never had any money and, you know, I've always had to, like, enjoy... I've always enjoyed the hunt and, like, I love going to the pawn shop and just turning everything on and playing everything, you know, checking all the guitars out. I don't care if it says garbage guitar from China nobody will ever like. Like, pick it up because you just never know. You just never know. I mean, I have, like... 40 guitars and 30 amps and, you know, all this shit that it's just like, yeah, it's just like, probably maybe I'm the only, maybe I'm the only person who likes it, but it's great, you know, I think That's you find a lot of cool stuff. Yeah, if you don't follow trends, if you really go out and hunt things, the thrill of the hunt, friends, just because you can buy shit on Reverb doesn't mean you need it, you know, and eBay, you gotta go out there and hunt for it, you're like, I could have bought a girl at the first girl I bought, I waited probably two years because I wanted to find a deal. I was like, I'm not paying more than $20 for one of these amps. And the one I used on the record, I paid $20 for. And it has the slightest rip in the speaker. Um, just the slightest issue with the speaker. And it sounds amazing. Do you think that adds anything to it, this tear? Or is it just... Uh, oh, yeah, absolutely. Kind of like Link Ray style? Yeah, absolutely. I mean... I don't think, like, you probably, if I pulled the speaker out, I, I don't think you would maybe even be able to see what's going on there, but there's definitely something. There's definitely, like, that speaker's either rotted or dry a little bit or something, but you can hear it. You can hear that slight, like, little discrepancy on the speaker, and it sounds, it sounds fucking, just don't, just take it from me, man. And now you look on eBay, now you look on eBay, they're a hundred fucking dollars. Now, I don't say I won't say I had anything to do with that, but <laughs> you know I'm very grateful. And the one that dude gave me, that gorilla that dude gave me at the record release, still had the original tag. It's dead stock. I was like, where the fuck did you find a dead stock gorilla? I felt bad about using it, but well, uh, let's talk about pedals. I know that you mentioned that you had that Ibanez U300, UE300. Do you still use that? I'm like a lot of people, and I'm sure you've had that conversation, like. A million times, man, but with this, this is the same reason I don't take my homes out anymore. Because, um, I mean, when I first started taking my homes out, people would be like, oh my God, where did you find that? And I'm like, <laughs> Fanny's. I found it at Fanny's. But, um, but yeah, like, it was the same thing with those UE300s. And when I first started using that Ibanez UE300, nobody used, nobody used that kind of chorus, like 80 sound. It wasn't popular again yet, yeah. especially in Nashville. Everybody thought I was crazy. Actually, a Western natural child was 
at one of the shows and he was just like, what do you got up there? And I could just see all these dudes coming over like, what do you got up there? And I was like, get out of here. (laughs) (laughs) Um, But yeah, so yeah, it just, I don't know. Uh, I got to the point where I played with it for like five years on stage and and it would just like became so stressful because it would have to jiggle the cable before, you know, I'm like, it would just be like some fucking bro ass fucking basement and the beer's like slowly lurking closer to it. And I was just like, I can't do this anymore <laughs> like, because they just kept getting more expensive because people would see me and other people with them. And yeah, they just kept getting more and more expensive. So now they're like fucking like $400. And so I... I retired it. Plus, um, yeah, it was just like, you know, it was just too stressful. And so I switched. I went to that cool music store in L.A., the one in Highland Park. I can't remember. I can never remember what it's called. But it's like the only cool music store in Highland Park. Um, It's right down the street from the hi-hat. And I really like them, and they're really cool. And, like, most people in L.A. aren't cool, and I don't like them. So it was cool, you know? Um, but yeah, like he had a bunch of tube screamers and tube screamer clones. So I lined up like six of them and just like tried to get as close to like that era tube screamer as possible. That's in the UE 300. Um, the best thing about it though, was how the chorus and the, um, it's a master switch, right? Have you ever seen a UE300? Yeah, it's like got four. I know for sure it has a tube screamer in it and it has the chorus and it looks like like what you would think. Like yeah. kind of has pedals built into like a multi-effect unit. There she is. And see, I got a new, I got, oh no, this is, I got a new chorus for my homes. I haven't gotten a new chorus for this. So you see the, the tape? Yeah. On the back. Yeah, trying to keep it held straight because I'm sure there's just like a loose wire. But I don't even want to open it. Like I'm not an idiot. I know how to solder, but. I don't, I don't fuck with my own shit. I'll let professionals do it. Uh, and also just like anything relating to power, I don't fuck with. But yeah, no, it just, uh, yeah, it just, it just became too much of a hassle. But when you turn it on, you have a master switch, turns on the stereo course and the tubes running at the same time. And that was like how I cut through because I started playing more leads and I needed to like get above the PV sludge. And I was like, fuck, like, I need something. And it was just perfect. It was just perfect. And I actually found two when I found this one in somebody's attic. And so I bought both of them. And then I sold one when I was on hard times one Christmas. And then during the slow tour season. (laughs) And then this one is the one (laughs) I've actually toured with. And and I would never sell. And I'll probably ask to be put in my Viking boat when they burn me because it's very special to me. I love it. But so I got this, um, I got this one and I know you're not going to believe me and no one is going to believe me, which is fine. I don't give a fuck. I got this one out of all the tube screamers and tube screamer clones that I found and lined up that day, this Route 808 overdrive by Visual Sound. Real tone for real people. (laughs) (laughs) Whoa, that's a lot. That's a lot to say, man. Oh, there's a battery back there. Uh Uh-oh. But yeah, uh, I know you're not going to believe it, but this is actually the best one. And yeah, it really was. Um, And the closest to that UE300. So I used this for a very long time, and it was on my board, and it was great. Um, at these settings, okay? Perfect. I don't know about other settings. <laughs> but then, you know, Earthquake put out the plumes, you know, and I'm not, I'm not going to put just any pedals on my board. I don't use a lot of pedals on stage, so if I'm going to put some on there, like, I, I actually have to like it. Um, and, uh, yeah, they put out the fucking plumes, and they sent me one, and I was like, plume schmooms. <laughs> Just another tube screamer clone. Good. And I fucking jacked. Oh, man. I was just like, wow. It's it's so fucking good. I love it. So that has replaced my Route 808. Uh, what is it again? Visual sound. <laughs> real tone for real people. Real people. 
That's right. <laughs> I'm real. <laughs> well, do you, do you want to sh kind of show us like what, what are some core sounds or key sounds that you get off your pedal board? Yeah. So basically, yeah, they're like, okay. And I also want to just shout out, okay, real quickly. <laughs> this new favorite thing I got. This new favorite thing I got. Oh. See this Ibanez PH7 phaser? These things, these are the next big thing, guys. I don't care what nobody says, because I don't like phasers. And this thing drives me nuts. This thing is a panty dropper. This is the panty dropper of phasers. Drop my own damn <laughs> panties. I, and do you see what it does? This is fucking genius, and I don't see why all pedals don't do this. Probably because it costs a lot. But if you like a setting, you lock it in. See that? Wow. I can tell. I can tell you're skeptical. Have you ever used one of these? I have not. I'm just saying, man. Just putting it in Don't. my ear. I'm going to show you what it can do. It's just like a real... There's, there's no other word for it than juicy. It's just a real juicy phaser. <laughs> well, you've set it up to be quite the pedal with, with the, the introduction you've given it with the juicy adjective and the panty dropper <laughs> yeah so, you've been alone for you've been alone for a long time i could tell <laughs> <laughs> um, so you can't see it but on my pedal board <laughs> these are my these are the ds ones that have been retired <laughs> these are my retired ds ones um and i know what you're saying LG, are you in eighth grade? Why do you use a DS1? Because it fucking works <laughs> good with the TV. You know what? I don't know about your amp. I don't know about anyone else's amp or guitar. But for me, in my classic XPV, in my humbucker life, the DS1 is the business. And I've tried because it's embarrassing. I want, yeah, to me, I feel like it's the distortion pedal equivalent to like a Line 6 um, pod, you know? I feel like people are judging me, you know, <laughs> but it just, it just does it, does it good. It just does well, it fucking good. Well, let's hear, do you have a DS1 plugged in now? Uh, a non-retired Yeah, that's one? what I've been using the whole time is my DS1. Um, Love it. We, what about the phaser? Or is that? So I use the DS1 into the Dispatch Master by Earthquaker Devices. And I don't know if you've used, have you ever used that? Yeah, it's a, it's a delay pedal with reverb, delay and reverb. Yeah, it's the delay reverb. I don't really use the verb too much because obviously I hate Fender amps, I hate reverb. Um, <laughs> but I just think it's an afterthought. I don't think you should go into anything with reverb. You know what I mean? Like I feel like people, I'm gonna let the sound guy handle reverb, you know? Like, I don't think, I don't know. Personal preference. But um, I use the delay and I always have it on. I have it just like at three o'clock in the mix at all times. Um, and I just like that, you know, cause I, I most of the time we, I play, I'm the only guitar player. So I really like to fill up space and make things sound meaty, you know? And I just like the texturally, like, I feel like that just sounds good just having it on all the time. And then, have you ever used a Rude Tech chorus? I have not. So my all the time tone is the Dispatch Master and the DS1. That's it. That's all I use all the time. So that's always on. It's not negotiable. That's what's always happening in every Thelma and Sleeve song. And then I have like my lead tone, which is, um, so if I'm playing like, <laughs> That's just like my tone. That's just how my tone sounds, right? And then if I want to do a, like a, a solo, I want to like cut some of the mids and, and bottom ends and just kind of get a little brightness, something that cuts, right? 
so I'll do the, and I want a little boost, so I use the plumes for that. Right? So, and then I add the chorus. So that's like, if I'm soloing, that's my tone most of the time when I'm soloing. It's just the 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 tube screamer, which kind of cuts out the mud and brightens things up, and and then um, and then the chorus. I just love '80s chorus. I just love ZZ Top and Van Halen, and I love chorus. I love the sound of cheap '80s music. So, <laughs> well, you, you, that's you mentioned I, '80s, so I gotta ask: Is there anything else that's on your pedal board that kind of lent itself to the new record? Because there's like a Machine Head, yeah. John Lord meets Robert Palmer kind of vibe. <gasps> there's like some organ or synth. Okay, or, stop. Like even even sir, like Kenny Loggins. Sir, Kenny Loggins had a bad day. Sir, I made that record a hundred percent. I a hundred percent trying to get a, a Robert Palmer vibe. Uh, <laughs> Which is like, let me try to sound like the Beatles. Like, it's never going to happen. Um, but, like, I definitely, like, went in with, like, a Robert Palmer vibe. And for the guitar, for, like, songs like Mary Beth um, and, like, oh. So, the really interesting thing is I have, like, a kit that I'll use to go to a studio. And, like, if I'm going to go record guitars, and I'll have, like, a little kit of, like, extra pedal, things that, like, I wouldn't necessarily put on my board, but I'll have, you know, because, like, we don't really play a lot of the slower songs live, um, because, like, I would get really bored, <laughs> you know what I mean, like, and I just, I don't, they're, they're very vulnerable, so we don't really play them live, but, so you can be a little bit more weird on the slower shit, and um, for I Bet You Cried, and for like the more princey sounding shit, the more 80s sounding shit, I used the Bit Commander by Earthquaker Devices. And what's really, and the Ghost Echo is another, so if I'm going to the studio, I'm going to bring my Pitch Bay, my Ghost Echo, my Bit Commander, and my C9 organ pedal. I also oh. use that a lot. Um, that's the, that's the John Lord vibe. Uh, and I, I actually gave that to the girl who's playing guitar with me right before we stopped playing because of Rona, I gave her this D9 because she was using it like a still guitar doing these swells um, and these harmonies with it. It was like... It, sound, cause it sounds so fucking cool. I'm not going to do it right now, but... And I used it a lot for leads like four years ago. If you watch videos or hear songs, I used the C9 a lot for leads before we got an organ player. After we got an organ player, I didn't. It wasn't necessary, but yeah, I I used the Big Commander a lot on the new album. Um, on probably like Million Kisses, that song has a shit ton of Big Commander. Uh, I probably should put the Big Commander on my board, but again, when you're on tour as much as I am, and you have so many things to do and so many things like you don't have management, you don't have any a merch person you don't have anything you're just out here like i try to not bring as many things as possible so for the but for the record um the big commander what would the best thing on i bet you cried is i'm playing a slide with the sharpie through oh. a big commander and it and it goes like because the sharpie was the only thing that was getting me that sound that i could hear in my head and I tried several different things, like a lighter, an actual slide. And I was like, man, do you have a Sharpie? And it did. It just, if you, a lot of people like that song a lot. And, you know, they're listening to me play guitar with a Sharpie through a Bit Commander. So, I just like, yeah, like I said, you just have to try things. But for just, um, so another thing that I'll do during leads, if I want like a different kind of tone for my leads, is... Um, I use the Nightwire 2. I know this sounds like a commercial for Earthquaker Devices, but I just really love their pedals. Um, so like, a song like Mary Beth, it's like... So, like 
Yeah, so I, I actually really like, I use the Nightwire, usually not that fast of an attack and not that many repeats, more like loose, but I'll use that a lot for solos because also it has a level boost, so it works good for solos. And that like, um, like high class woman, like if you play that, um, take the depth back a little bit. Here. with the Nightwire on, but like, if I'm using it on a song like Mary Beth, I'm obviously gonna turn up the rate and the depth, but if you pull it back, it just kinda gives you like a nice, not quite a wah, not quite like a phaser or anything, but just like a nice little kinda hug, a little push and pull. It sounds nice. Um, and like I said, it also has the boost, and so it, I just like any pedal, I think every pedal that Cuts any range of frequencies should have a boost, you know, <laughs> like, yeah, and they so surprisingly don't. Lose don't. And then, yeah, this phaser, which I haven't put on my board to play live yet because I haven't played live with it yet, but I might. I might. I want to make a believer out of you, sir. <laughs> and it actually sounds. <laughs> Maybe it doesn't, but it's it it wets my whistle every time. Uh, yeah, I just like how squishy. And when you put them both together, like. Um. What the fuck? <laughs> that sounds cool. Phaser, Nightwire, DS1. That was ugh. I'm definitely gonna be doing that live. I hope. I hope. Very soon. But yeah, those are those are usually I would say C9 organ pedal and the phaser may make appearances and the Bit Commander make appearances. But overall, if I'm playing live, it's just DS1 and Dispatch Master. Until it's time to add the chorus, which is the Rude Tech chorus, which is the guy in Nashville. I think he actually stopped making them. And that's, aside from my Boston Ibanez fetish, that's the only other pedal I use, um, is the Rude Tech chorus. And then, um, that isn't an Earthquaker pedal. And then, yeah, the Plumes and the Nightwire. Right on, and, and is there any point Maybe it's a little too much for the PV and the 410 is uh, anytime you ever use fuzz, because I know that, you know, uh, like a fuzz pedal. You know, I think it can, I, I think a fuzz is great. Um, but, you know, I just, I, I like the Spires by Earthquaker out, out of all the fuzzes that um, I've been offered and, and to play. I really do enjoy that. And I like the Maestro fuzz. I use the Maestro fuzz a lot because battle tapes. Um, would let me use um, his in the studio um, and got some really gnarly tones out of it. And I, if, I, if I could find one of those, I would probably have a fuzz or something comparable to that. I like the fuzz that sounds like a horn, you know, that makes your shit oh. sound like a saxophone. Like that's the kind of fuzz that I like in the Stooges sound. But I haven't found anything that like kind of gives me that nut yet, you know? Mm -hmm. um, I probably can't use, I don't know if you can use that, but it's true. Um, <laughs> I haven't found anything that I've, I've found that, that, and I've looked at a lot of shit, but yeah, I don't really use fuzz cause it's obnoxious and like our songs are very dynamic. We don't really get credit for that cause not a lot of people actually listen to our music. They just like think we're a trashy like rock and roll party band, which I mean we are in some ways, but like our music's a little bit more 
you know, dynamic than what, you know, and, and if I do do a slower song, like Long Cold Woman or something like that's more of a stomper, more of a stooges vibe, like, I don't want to sound just like that, you know, it's, it's kind of overused, um, fuzz, in my opinion, it's a cop out and it's a little overused, so I've never really, I've never really gotten into it, I get why other people do though, but it's just not for me and my sound, God. because, I think like the most important and the most defining thing about Thelma and the Sleeves across all of our records and all of the lineup changes and all of what's happened is my tone. You know what I mean? And the and my guitar. So like and voice obviously. And so like those two things like I will wander away and I will try new things, but like the DS1 with the humbucker and a PV is LG. You know what I mean? I'm like, <laughs> all this has led me back. As, I've, I've, as far as I've come, I've never strayed from what just felt good to me and made me want to play guitar and made me want to get in front of an artist. And, I, and every time I like drive 10 fucking hours straight by myself because I don't trust anyone else to drive and get on the fucking stage and I feel like shit boiled over like and I turn on this PV and I just like go like that like I'm just like uh <laughs> it's like a reset button it's like I'm gonna get to play this loud and fucking it's like I'm gonna like turn somebody on tonight like it makes you feel good so I don't think I'll ever change I don't think I'll ever change <laughs> but yeah that's my, I hope that answered your question about fuzz. <laughs> it did. And it answered other questions I didn't even ask, but I appreciate you going in depth like that. LG, you're, act, yeah. you're active online. And like I said, you have a podcast that people should check out. Where, where, where should they track you down online and, and tune into what you're doing? Well, uh, I always tell people, you know, the best way to get a hold of me and also to stay up to date with what I'm doing is fucking Instagram. Um, because that's just the easiest thing for me to use. Um, and that's where I have the biggest audience. So I'm on Instagram, but of course you have them in the sleaze.com and that offers many treasures, uh, but mostly Instagram. And, um, yeah, uh, we're about to put on a new EP called, I'm telling you first, sir, <laughs> we're putting out a new EP called, uh, and by we, I mean, I and my drummer pig pan in LA, um, we did like a postal service album together and it's going to come out next month um, called Sacred as Hell. <laughs> so I'm excited for that. And hopefully Perfect. just in time for the holidays. Yeah, no, we're going to have like a whole, we're going to have a big record release on December 17th, which because 27 is our lucky number. That's why it's on the Pacifica, like as a band, that's collectively like our, our lucky number is 27. And, um, uh yeah it's gonna be live from muscle shoals um and we got a studio we're gonna rent and and the girls are coming down we're gonna play a big show and we're gonna put out a new shirt specifically for it's like i'm like trying to set myself up for the spring so if you do me a solid and come watch the fucking record release and buy the new ep so i don't have to fucking go outside and get rona i could stay in here where it's safe and until it's time to rock and roll again uh that'd be great <laughs> so, because yeah, I've been quarantined for like nine months, so I haven't left really. Well, that's good. You're you're being responsible. Well, I'm also terrified because I've been hanging out in you know bars, smoky bars, and chain smoking for the last tw twenty years. So uh, I gotta be real careful. <laughs> I don't want I don't want a respiratory uh, virus to attack me. And plus, like I'm very important. I'm like very antagonizing. Very. Uh, polarizing figure in the rock and roll uh, stage, national stage. So, like, it's important that I exist, uh, you know? It's important. <laughs> you know, a lot of bands have been, like, saying shit now, but I've been saying shit for years, you know? I've been talking shit for years. So, uh, yeah, so, like, I really, you know, I, I'm, I'm, working I'm a working-class hero, and I got to stay here. So I've been real careful, and, but, yeah, yeah. Uh, and, and thank you, to, and all my fans have been really supportive and, and wonderful, and 
I've been able to get some cool gigs and stuff. But yeah, for the most part, uh, fingers crossed that people like this homemade EP, which is also very stressful because I've never fully recorded and produced an album myself. Um, so that is exciting. I, I produced Fuck, Mary Kill, but I didn't like... On this, I play all the instruments and do everything and recorded it all. And I mean, it sounds like demos, but it sounds cool, you know? And then... Mm -hmm. It's real 80s sounded, actually. If you like the 80s, you're still about what I do. It's just getting... I'm just apparently going further back in time, but soon I'll get to the 70s again. Um, but yeah. Um, so yeah, hopefully people like it. It's a little stressful, but, you know, I got good fans. So I'm not too worried about it. I just... I'm just got to keep them. I don't care if I get any new ones, but I well, don't want to piss I off the ones I got. LG, I, I thank you for the time and setting up all your rig and then uh, kind of letting it invade your space and uh, talking gear with us for the afternoon. And like I said, Dude, people need to check out you your so Instagram. Much for and, uh, me. It can stay up with uh, Queen of Shit Mountain podcast. People got to check that out as well. Keep up on yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. So thank you again. I yeah, appreciate it. Yeah, please do. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for having me and uh, stay safe, man. It's good talking to you. Yeah, as I say, everyone out there, stay safe just like LG. Later. <laughs>